Yeah, thank you, Afa, uh, for uh, for this introduction and thanks for having me. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, to present this talk. Uh, too bad it's not not in person in, uh, in Faculty of Physics. I I would love to be there, maybe next year, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, yes. So I'll be talking about a uh, uh, project on uh, quantum computational advantage or supremacy with fermion sampling. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, Inat Dangian, who was until recently postdoc in my group uh, in Warsaw, Mario Morales, a uh, PhD student from, uh, from University of Technology Sydney, and uh, my long friend and collaborator, Zoltan Simboras, from uh, Budapest, Ignorance. And uh, we put this work uh, on archive just in the end of uh, last year. You can check it out. So uh, it's a bit lengthy and technical work. So I, I won't be going that much into details here. So uh, no, normally I wouldn't want people in the audience maybe to, to check their laptops during the presentation, but now you're anyway staring at your laptop so you can maybe in the meantime, check out the paper if you are interested. Okay, so uh, let us start. Uh, so uh, first, just in hindsight, what what we are doing? So uh, we are proposing a, a scheme for attaining quantum computational advantage or supremacy that utilizes uh, uh, a class of circuits called uh, called fermionic linear optics. This FLO stands for fermionic linear optics. Uh, it's a restricted class of quantum circuits that I will be describing later. Uh, and the scheme is basically as follows. So you initialize your circuit, like n qubit circuit uh, in a tensor product of so-called magic states. Do you see my mouse or not? Probably not. Uh, we, see, we see your mouse. Ah, you see, okay. Uh, you can also explain why Psi4 is so special, this 4 is why. It, why I, will, I will be explaining this. Like this is just, a, so those are some special specific states that are ch uh, not computational basis states. Uh, okay, you, you apply this fermionic linear optics. This is some, uh, some class of transformations. You measure in the computational basis. Uh, yeah, and we claim uh, you do it for random, just like for random quantum circuits that Google, for instance, implements. You measure it for for random uh, random FLO circuits. I will be descri describing what this means in a, uh, like throughout the talk. Okay, and we uh, we have the following claim, uh, claims. Okay, so this is like a fermionic analog of boson something, uh, and uh, even though it's a fermionic. Uh, it's based on it's based on fermionic transformations. It's we claim it's feasible in the near term architectures uh, on let's say superconducting qubits, and we give hardness guarantees that let's say are comparable or match the hardness guarantees for that are currently present for random circuit sampling, and therefore okay, it's stronger than than boson sampling. That may be uh, implied in his first question during the introduction. Okay, so uh, before I go into the business, uh, I just want to sketch like the context in which this quantum uh, advantage proposal arises. Okay, so you know we have this boom for quantum computers these days, uh, but they are noisy, imperfect, uh, currently not yet scalable. Uh, like you have limited sizes, maybe few dozens of qubits and uh, yeah implementation of more involved quantum algorithm algorithms like so for example is basically a science fiction nowadays so I uh, uh, like took for you some more or less I think state-of-the-art paper about optimized implementation of uh, short uh, algorithm on uh, noisy devices uh, from like a bit more than a year ago, uh, and it's 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 crazy. Okay, I uh, uh, I mean there, I mean this is a strong improvement compared to recent previous results, but 
you have to like if you have this physical uh, error rate of order 0.1 percent you are in a planner architecture right to uh, yeah you, you basically need to to have like 20 million physical million physical qubits right uh, so uh, by no means we are there okay uh, yeah so and, uh, by the way, uh, if, uh, if there are any questions or comments, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so still we hope that those near-term quantum computers will be useful for something. Uh, this was advocated among other people by, by John Preskill in his uh, nice paper from 2018. And I just want to outline one, one proposal for uh, such a quantum let's say, for the usefulness of quantum computers in the near term. And uh, these are variational quantum algorithms. Uh, so I, uh, I sketch for you what, what they are. So the idea is that you, uh, your task actually is to minimize, uh, minimize uh, find the lowest energy uh, state of some Hamiltonian. And the way you do it, you have some a uh, relatively simple parameterized quantum circuit okay, that, that is maybe not very complicated. It, it depends on some parameters, right? A bunch of parameters. So what you do, you delegate variational method, which is known, I guess, in, in physics, to, to quantum uh, device, uh, like subroutine of variational algorithm to the quantum device. So what, what you do, you uh, you fit in some simple state to your circuit. You let it evolve through the circuit. Uh, then you you measure this expectation value. Uh, it depends on those parameters, uh, and then you run very uh, you know so, so this you do quantumly, and then you put this in the uh, classical loop. So you you, put, uh, you do some I don't know gradient descent or some method that allows you to update values of, of those angles. You change the circuit, uh, hoping that as a result you will converge to the low energy uh, state. Right. But now when when this Hamiltonian is classical, that is diagonal in the computational basis. Uh, this corresponds to can correspond to uh, some class of classical optimization problems like max cut or classical spin glasses. For example, there are some noises, perhaps. Uh, for example, then when when you have a quantum, generally quantum Hamiltonian, when you have non-commuting terms, uh, this is something relevant. For example, for quantum chemistry. And uh, yeah, I just want to say that in the near term, those uh, we are really limited to use small in-depth quantum circuits. And therefore, uh, those uh, parametric circuits are like the natural choice and they will be useful. They are useful and they will be useful in the near term. And uh, just wanted to, to mention that there were already some nice proof of principle experiments for those uh, for those routines. So uh, uh, right in this, uh, there were actually two papers by Google uh, that implemented this uh, like classical uh, like optimization of classical Hamiltonian for some class of problems on twenty three qubits, and also. Uh, they did some proof of principle quantum chemistry computation. So they delegated Hartley Fock method to a quantum computer. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that they uh, basically they, uh, they were trying to simulate quantum chemistry, so fermionic systems. Uh, and they were using, okay, those given rotations you see here. Uh, yeah, it would be relevant for, for us because we will be having similar, uh, let's say, similar uh, things in our proposal. Can, I, can um, I interrupt you, Michal, for a second? Of course, of course. So usually when, when people talk about this combinatorial 
classical problems that are supposed to be solved by quantum computers, it's more natural to, to think of adiabatic computation, yes, then. Because you have this Hamiltonian and this ground state is the solution to, to your problem. Okay, and then, then you, you run this adiabatic approach. And I wonder how, how natural it is with, with gate. Uh, right, um, so actually you can view this QA away uh, as somehow like a generalization of uh, adiabatic, uh, uh, adiabatic quantum uh, computing in a sense that you like typically you have uh, uh, typically in order to show that this QA uh, QA away can work, people use arguments from adiabatic quantum computing. So it's in principle more flexible, okay? Uh, than uh, it's in principle more uh, flexible than uh, uh, than adiabatic. I so actually I'm uh, because maybe towards the end I can I mean there is a there is a connection between the two. Uh, because, because usually I understand that yeah. if you, for example, go from standard gate approach to adiabatic, you have these huge overheads. I like polynomial, but overheads in, in mm. complexity somehow. I was wondering right. if the opposite direction, do you also have it or yeah. no? Yeah, so the point is the, the, the issue with those uh, near term methods is that they, they don't have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, guarantees, let's say, of convergence. It's more like a heuristic, which is motivated okay. by, uh, uh, for example, by adiabatic quantum computing. You can actually, you can see that when you trotterize the path in adiabatic quantum computing, then this is, that would correspond to some specific implementation or the choice of parameters of those angles, okay? Okay, of, uh, yes, I see. Away. So okay. now you can do a bit, you can argue you have a bit more freedom, but as far as the, uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, it will be, pra I, I actually personally think that this QA, QA away won't be that much practical in the future, more this, those, those quantum chemistry or those non-commuting Hamiltonians, they would be more prominent. Uh, yeah, just. Uh, okay, okay, that, yeah. That, thanks. Let's just go on. Okay, so now, as I said, those, those proposals, those proposals are, um, uh, they are heuristic. You typically don't have uh, like guarantees that this quantum processor would perform much better than some classical method. So there is a like a dual approach uh, that aims to utilize near-term quantum computers to the, uh, to the fullest, namely this quantum computational advantage or supremacy. So the idea is that you want to engineer a, a, a task or a problem uh, for, for which you will have a speed up uh, for some, uh, uh, which is not maybe for a practical problem, but you can have some uh, theoretical guarantees that you have the speed up. And uh, typically those, uh, uh, those proposals, they come in uh, via sampling problems. So the task is to, uh, the task is to, uh, this, uh, what, what quantum circuit does, it samples uh, from some probability distribution, right? Uh, and now the, the task of a uh, classical computer is to uh, uh, sample from distribution uh, that would be in some sense uh, uh, like close to this uh, target uh, quantum distribution. And there are some notions of, of, uh, of error uh, that you can have here. One is the relative error, uh, which, which states that the, uh, like this, the simulated uh, uh, simulated distribution is uh, like every every element, every probability is close in relative error to the true probability, okay, directed by a quantum device. And the more realistic one is the uh, is based on total variation distance, uh, yeah, and so. As I said, the yeah okay, the potential advantages of such schemes is that you maybe have smaller technological requirements, uh, and as I'm gonna argue, you have hardness guarantees based on complexity theory. Uh, the cons is that it's not necessarily a practical problem. Uh, noise still affects those proposals, and certification becomes an issue. 
So let me go a bit more into detail uh, uh, about the structure of, uh, of those results, quantum advantage results. So first caveat is that in computer science, theoretical computer science, polynomial time computation is typically like, okay, uh, identified with uh, efficiency. Okay, so you say that computation is efficient if it can be uh, done task a computer in a polynomial time. And you have those, those complexity classes, right? So, so you have this problem, this class of problems P, problem solvable in polynomial time on a classical computer, uh, let's say BPP, which are problems that can be solved in a, uh, uh, which can be solved uh, on a quantum uh, computer in the polynomial time. Uh, you have uh, this blue guy, BPP, which are problems that can, uh, that are uh, that can be solved in a polynomial time in a probabilistic fashion with abundant error by a classical computer. Um, you have famous and P and P class, right? Which is a class of decision problems that can be efficiently verified by a classical computer, uh, right? Uh, and the point is, people in complexity theory they, they discuss generalizations of, of this P and P classes. They uh, I'm not going to explain them in detail. They they have like a hierarchy, right? That uh, that they call uh, polynomial hierarchy. That's why this abbreviation PH. And they uh, so this is a hierarchy of uh, decision problems uh, that somehow generalizes this and, and P class and people act like they expect that this hierarchy is infinite, that it doesn't collapse. And uh, there are many theoretical works that sort of suggest it. And now let me give you the structure, like logical structure of those quantum uh, advantage results. So uh, they, they take the following form. So uh, you, you assume that uh, there exists uh, for some quantum circuit V that belongs to some class uh, E, uh, that there exists a classical sampler for uh, for probability distribution gener uh, that approximates uh, either in relative or in additive error uh, the, the true probability distribution. It samples from probability that, that approximates in relative or additive error, the, the true probability distribution. Then you put in some results and conjectures, okay? Some uh, from, from, from complexity theory, and then you get a conclusion that the polynomial hierarchy collapses, okay? And this is what people in theoretical computer science don't expect. So this is then evidence like such a result is then an evidence that such a efficient classical sampler that would be mimicking the behavior of quantum device doesn't exist. And uh, just quickly, people uh, for the real, okay, this notion of relative error is very, uh, okay, it's, but it's relatively easy to establish such results. They were established more than 15, 10 years ago for various class of circuits. But it's not realistic, this relative error. So people are much more interested in this additive total variation distance error. Uh, and there was a bunch of works uh, in that direction. Okay, boson sampling, instantaneous quantum polynomial time. Uh, lastly, uh, there, there is strong theoretical evidence also for random circuit sampling. Uh, that was experimentally realized uh, recently by Google. So, uh, uh, so, so uh, yeah. can I interrupt you? So concerning this yeah. Google demonstration, this yeah. they also so so the, I understand that the advantage in their case was also based on this conjecture that polynomial hierarchy does not collapse. Yes, so it was not yes, like yes. proof of 
advantage without no. this this assumption right so actually i will be talking a bit more hopefully i will be talking a bit more in detail about it later uh yeah so let me say this that this uh this conjecture that polynomial hierarchy doesn't collapse is the least controversial conjecture uh, uh that that is used in those results there are some uh uh, some other conjectures about specific problems that are thrown in. I will be talking about them hopefully later. Okay, so it's not like it's all uh, because of the status of theoretical computer science, those things are not rigorously proven. They are based on conjectures still, as we don't know if p equals is n p equals to n p and so on. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I continue. So uh, just the uh, Show, yeah, so so uh, this random quantum, uh, random circuit sampling realized by Google is like basically amounts to uh, applying an array of randomly chosen uh, nearest neighbor gates uh, in the 2D uh, architecture uh, and measuring uh, after a bunch of layers of those gates and, and, and measuring the qubits, right? And uh, concerning boson sampling, uh, here you initialize uh, your system uh, system of bosons, photons in a, in some uh, Fox state. Uh, you have a single photon uh, single photons that uh, enter each mode, indistinguishable photon. And then you let them evolve via linear optical interferometer. And lastly, you measure what happens in the in the output. Uh, and Google, uh, together with UC, uh, UC, uh, UCSB, uh, did the experiment on 53 qubits, uh, recently famous one. Also, just maybe two, two months ago, there was a proposal, uh, there was a, a beautiful experiment by uh, Jawai Pan group in Hei, uh, Hefei that, uh, that did 50 uh, to 70 photons in uh, Gaussian boson sample. So some generalization of standard process. As I said, there are issues with, with those proposals based like because you can you have uh, it's hard to certify them, very hard to certify them, and you have to compete with efficient classical simulators because uh, they are also improving. <laughs> okay, uh, right. So after this introduction, I'm always uh, over time. Sorry, I can finally move to our proposal. <laughs> Okay, so this is the context. Here is our proposal. Um, so it's gonna be again a something task, uh, but we are gonna have uh, this, this this FLO circuit here, a random FLO circuit uh, that will be initialized in the tensor copy of so-called uh, many tensor copies of so-called magic states that are basically specific, let's say, G8Z states that are written here for Qubit G8Z states. Uh, right, uh, so the, the task is to run the circuit for random V belonging to this class uh, measure. Uh, yeah, so what are those fermionic linear optical transformations? So they are known from condensed matter uh, or from, yeah, from condensed matter or from many body physics. So we consider par parallel two classes of transformations, passive fermionic linear optics and active fermionic linear optics. So they are just fermionic counterparts of what people might know, like for uh, bosons. So you have passive trans bosonic transformations and active bosonic transformations. So, so, uh, I will be explaining that in a second. And here are our results, okay? Um, so uh, first of all, we prove so-called anti-concentration property for outcome probabilities for typical passive and active FLO circuits initialized in a, in a magic state. Uh, second, uh, we, uh, we prove average case sharp P hardness of uh, of uh, of uh, outcome probabilities for both 
classes of circuits. Uh, and we do also, uh, okay, we, we want to say something about certification of this proposal. So we do some step in that direction by showing that you can efficiently certify an unknown uh, operation V, which you know is in this class fermionic linear optic. So uh, I realize that it's quite a lot to unpack here, and uh, I'm talking for like 25 minutes now already. So what I would be doing now, I, I will just uh, present in detail what are uh, what are those circuits, those FLL circuits. Uh, then I will talk about certification because it's maybe the least technically demanding part. And then in the very end, I'll be talking about the hardness and uh, those true theoretical results. But uh, I think it's more important to, to understand why those things are, uh, uh, are useful for something rather than how exactly, because the paper has 67 pages. So. Right. So, uh, fermionic linear optics. Uh, so, uh, Hubert space when fermion leave uh, uh, is fermionic Fox space, uh, which can you can see it as a direct sum of sectors with fixed particle, uh, fixed number of fermions. And in the space, you have a natural action of creation and initiation operators, fermionic ones. Uh, that satisfy canonical anti-commutation relations as written here. Uh, you can also define analogs of optical quadratures for those systems, so-called Majorana fermion operators. So they are, in a sense, Hermitian counterparts of creation and annihilation operators. They also satisfy some, some funny relations like that, anti-commutation relations. Uh, this whole space lives uh, like is spanned by uh, fermionic Fox states that have definite number of particles in in different fermionic modes. And now I can define classes of my transformations in this fermionic uh, space. This passive fermionic uh, linear optics corresponds to as linear trans unitary transformations of uh, uh, creation initiation operators. Uh, in the first quantization picture, you just like every particle evolves independently by, by some unitary uh, U. And importantly, this is a representation of the unitary group in our uh, in our spec. Active transformations they uh, they give rise to uh, what they are just uh, okay generalizations uh, of that. Uh, so you you have linear transformations now via orthogonal group uh, of Majorana modes. Uh, and uh, basically it corresponds to having to having uh, uh, Hamiltonians that are quadratic in uh, in Major in Majorana monomials, or in other words, quadratic in creation and initiation uh, of Operations. You can think of it as somehow analogs, maybe, okay, not maybe analogs of squeezing, but analog of Gaussian, uh, Gaussian, the uh, uh, bosonic linear optics. And it's uh, actually a projective representation of the orthogonal group uh, in the fermionic Fox space. So, uh, well, that's great. But uh, I, I was thinking about some circuits about implementing uh, this, this proposal somewhere. So can you implement some, some things like that? Well, uh, so fermions, uh, bosons, you guys know, they photons, they don't interact among themselves typically. And it's fairly easy to re realize, for example, this class of transformations for, for photons in the network of linear interferometers. But fermions, they are typically charged, like electrons, and they tend to interact, so you cannot easily implement such transformation. So, so what we are going to do, we are going to map this system into qubits and then implement uh, the corresponding gates. Now, uh, Jordan, uh, this is done by a Jordan Wigner transformation that, mark, that maps the system of fermions, uh, the fermionic modes into the qubits. And 
it's like that. So you you map uh, oc uh, occupational number Fox states into computational basis states. You you map Majorana monomials into strings of Pauli operators. Okay. Uh, I need to speed up a bit. Sorry. So particle number measurements are then mapped to computational basis measurements in in, uh, in qubits and local uh, particle preserving quadratic Hamiltonians uh, are mapped to specific Hamiltonians that are generated by via like uh, lo the following local interaction. So uh, this is our dictionary between fermions into qubits. So now what we are going to do, we are going to use some ideas that are maybe familiar to some of you guys in optics. So it is known that arbitrary unitary transformation, some abstract unitary transformation or orthogonal transformation can be decomposed into an array of mode local transformations on the line by schemes that you guys know, uh, like Rex Zeilinger scheme or Clement scheme. This is like for optics, right? But what is happening here, those are just the compositions of arbitrary unitary transformations into, uh, into primitive two, uh, two mode transformations. So because of this dictionary that I, uh, that I sketched earlier, when you represent those groups, uh, when you represent those groups in, uh, in, in a qubit space via those representations that I was describing, you can then realize arbitrary FLO circuit in the, uh, by a circuit that has that which is linear in the number of modes in the one dimensional architecture. And crucially, as you actually implement uh, this, this dictionary, the, the gates that, that turn out to be necessary, they are native to the superconducting architecture, architectures. And you, uh, like people are interested anyway to implement uh, in implementing them on uh, on superconducting uh, qubits because of those applications for variational algorithms I mentioned in the very beginning. All right, so uh, that's why we say it's not crazy what we are proposing. Okay, uh, right. Any any questions to this? Uh, so maybe a general question, Michal. Your idea will be to also simulate the fermions with the superconducting architecture, or because this exactly. is exactly no, no. This is the idea. Yes. Okay. Okay. So you are okay. So it's not for the proofs. It's actually if you want if you want to build it, simulate the fermions. Yeah. So the superconducting I'm not giving you the the proofs okay. here. <laughs> I'm just no, no, sort just of constant. saying that this is not a crazy thing to implement. Uh, in. Uh, so uh, now efficient tomography of uh, uh, fermionic and optical circuits. So uh, you guys know that when I have multi-qubit system, I have a curse of dimensionality. That is to say, I, I need to, like I, in order to do proper tomography of some quantum channel acting on qubits, I like its exponential sample complexity, uh, exponential post-processing complexity. But I want to convince you that it's possible to do efficient tomography of unknown circuits if you know that they are they belong to this FLO class. So this is a uh, so this is for the implementation uh, via the dictionary that I told you. So uh, the scheme goes like that: <coughs> you you'll be preparing some specific, uh, very simple states. Uh, so. Uh, X plus state or Y plus state on the on the fifth qubit and zero qubit on other in other places. You'll be applying this V, and now you are measuring. Uh, you re uh, okay. You repeat uh, a, a number of times to get enough statistics. Uh, you'll be measuring Majorana uh, like well Majorana fermion operators. Okay. Uh, that are okay given here, uh, like for for different uh, 
for different uh, Majorana, uh, for, for different Majorana operators, and that corresponds to just measuring those Pauli strings, which is also not, let's say, not that crazy, because it's, it can be done via simple rotations and computational basis measure. I'm not going to give the proof of that, but point is, if you collect now statistics uh, from from statistics of the, this experiment, you can. Uh, recover the orthogonal transformation, which is beyond this, beyond like this, this depends on some, on some O, okay? this belongs on some O. So you can recover this O, you can estimate it, and you, you can then compute, like, okay, that, that gives you, this is the description of your operator, uh, of your unitary that was acting in the system. And our first result, uh, yeah, I have 10 more minutes. First result is that, funnily enough, you uh, you can get strong uh, like uh, you can estimate uh, you can get precision epsilon in the diamond norm of estimation of unknown v using just a uh, number of measurements uh, like measurement rounds which is which scales polynomially with the system size, which is uh, which is nice because in general you need exponential. Uh, it will be exponential in D. D is the number of modes uh, or number of cubes. So this is the result not about advantage, it's just about certification. So uh, now I, I move to, uh, yes, I'm running out of time. Uh, I move to, 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 hard, uh, to some arguments for hardness of this Fermi sampling. Uh, so first, for people that know this subject, this proposal of ours can be a bit, uh, sound a bit crazy because it is actually well known uh, that if the initial state was Gaussian, so uh, let's say computational basis state or fermionic Gaussian state, or it would be a single state of determinant, then some, the sampling task would be classically easy. And this, this was realized like 20 years ago by Valian, Perhaut de Vincenzo. Okay. And the reason for that, like it's it's actually striking, uh, and this is the reason why people didn't go for this frame something before. Okay, because uh, when you have fermions, uh, probability amplitudes are associated to determinants of let's say of your uh, sub matrices, okay? Uh, sub matrices of, of your uh, of, uh, of the let's say u that that gives the circuit, but for uh, and determinant can be easily computed, but for bosons, you have this permanent, which is a a variant of determinant that doesn't have this sign of the permutation. No sign. Um, so and it's a big dichotomy uh, between determinants in, and permanent in complexity theory. Uh, right, so we don't have uh, this for fermions, don't we? But maybe, uh, maybe we have actually. Uh, so that's why we need those magic states uh, that I indicated in the beginning. Uh, and it was uh, like okay, some some years back, uh, it was realized by by Dmitry Ivanov that uh, that. For, for the problem that we study for, let's say, passive linear optics, probability amplitudes are related to so-called mixed discriminants that are, you can consider them as like, well, sums of uh, uh, sums of the, like, uh, the determinants uh, over many, yeah, like many, uh, you have to compute many determinants to compute this uh, mixed discriminant. And they also have this hardness, okay, this sharply hardness, those mixed discriminants. Alternatively, you could uh, get analogous results about sharply hardness from the fact that those states, psi 4, are actually uh, magic states uh, for fermionic linear optics uh, computation, and they promote, uh, promote uh, this model to computational universality. Okay, uh, so Rafa, here's the question. So uh, I have technically five minutes, I imagine. So 
can I stretch? You can, maybe you can, 10 you minutes? can have 10 minutes. Okay, so then I, I will say some, at least something. Okay, I won't be, I'll be just explaining why what we did is maybe interesting, not how we did it. All right, uh, so, but this is just hardness of one particular probability amplitude. Can it be translated to hardness of something, right? Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, yeah, from a class of uh, 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 class of circuits, like how does like uh, approximate something with respect to this additive error? So what I'm gonna say now is just some general scheme uh, how those schemes are uh, how those schemes are proven. Okay, uh, so in uh, for any proposal like random quantum circuit or boson sample, so. This is not the case that without any work, you get this hardness. Comp Let me emphasize, because, okay, it's just didactic for students. So the fact that some particular probability amplitude for some specific V is hard, it's not the same as saying that something is hard. It's not the same in general. So some work has to be done. Uh, right. And uh, I will just present in those next few minutes how this general, what is the general scheme that that why why this like how how the results the results go? So you start from efficient approximate sampler for for a class of uh, uh, circuits, and then then you have when you use so-called anti-concentration property. This is some property that says that typical values of those probabilities are not very low. They are they will be quite large with some large probability. I don't have time to explain. And you throw in some uh, some results from complexity theory like Toda theorem, but this is theorem, not conjecture. And uh, Toda theorem and what Stockmeyer algorithm. Then you know if you have this efficient approximate sampler for generic circuits from this class of circuits, then you know that you can approximate uh, 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 you can approximate probability amplitudes uh, for generic up to relative error uh, for generic elements V from your ensemble in the third level of this polynomial hierarchy that I told you about. So now, when you throw in a conjecture that it is uh, actually hard to approximate uh, those uh, those probabilities uh, in the relative error for generic piece, uh, okay, it is uh, okay if if you know it is uh, sharp uh, sharp p hard, then you you will get a conclusion that. Uh, that polynomial hierarchy would would collapse, okay. Uh, but this is this is just a conjecture, and what people know what what do they people know? Uh, yeah, like they, they can give some supports for this conjecture, so they can prove average case hardness of approximation of uh, uh, of generic probability amplitudes up to some error, okay. Uh, and for random quantum circuits, this anti-concentration follows from uh, approximate to design property that they satisfy, and it was established in an array of works. For random quantum, uh, 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 this, the support for this conjecture was established very recently by Mobasak and uh, Bulan, Vazirani, Pfefferman, quite recently. So this is how those things are done. And what can I say? Like, you can do, you can play the same game for, for fermion uh, sampling, <laughs> and our first result is that this anti-concentration holds. Some things have to be proven to show it, and many things have to be proven. The second result is that this uh, we also give this average case approximation uh, of, of probability amplitudes up to uh, some exponentially small error. So, in that sense, we are just comparable to random quantum circuits. Uh, 
by the way, neither anti-concentration nor average case hardness of probability amplitudes is not established for for boson uh, for boson sample. In that sense, what we have is stronger. Right. So I have five minutes, right, Rafael? Five. Five. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, right. So our yeah, so, so this is a quantitative statement about those fermionic circuits. So uh, they anti-concentrate uh, in the following precise sense. So, 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 so probability, you, you fix some outcome, uh, probability over higher random V uh, that, that, uh, that your probability is, is larger than some fraction uh, of, of expectation value, because expectation value is one over the dimension of the qubit space, is, is not so small. This is the sum concentration. Right. And maybe importantly, previously, in order to establish people this, this kind of results for, uh, for random quantum circuits, people use two design properties. But, uh, but we use some group theoretical computation uh, to, to establish it. So we, Actually, it's known that they don't, uh, that uh, uh, that FLO doesn't form two design. Great, and actually, yeah, the, the, this average case hardness. What can I say? Uh, it's some beautiful actual application of, uh, uh, yeah. Maybe if there are questions, I can just describe it. I just say that some nice mathematical physics appears and some, some maps between Lie algebras and the corresponding Lie groups, which are then lifted to develop representations to, to give uh, low degree rational interpolation between, uh, between trappy hard probability amplitudes and uh, probability amplitudes corresponding to generic circuits. Uh, and the difference compared to the to, to the work by Movasak that did it for random quantum circuits is that he was using the, those techniques based on KLE transform on individual gates, uh, and we do it uh, on the level of symmetry group that underlines the representation at hand. Yeah, uh, so I'm wrapping up. Uh, yes, I presented to you uh, this, this scheme for uh, fermion sampling with magic input states. Hopefully, I convinced you that it's experimentally feasible on the, on Newton devices, at least in principle. Uh, I also showed that uh, that unknown FLO unitary can be efficiently certified. We have. Uh, Theoretical results about anti-concentration and so-called average case hardness that that put hardness guarantees of this model in pair with the let's say random quantum circuit model uh, of quantum advantage, uh, which I think is nice. Um, and here are some some open problems uh, for the future. It would be very interesting to uh, explore classical simulations of. Uh, of this fermion sampling and in general match gate circuits, also because of uh, applications in quantum chemistry, there is an issue of verification and certification of this fermion sampling. Uh, uh, also, uh, the the probability amplitudes that that we get in the scheme they are related to those matrix uh, uh, mixed discriminants. And this can have some applications in some uh, graph theoretic problems because people consider some similar stuff for Gaussian boson something. And lastly, what I want to do soon is to kind of use the techniques that uh, that we learned in this project to actually push the the hardness guarantees for boson something and Ga Gaussian boson something. Uh, which are not present currently. Right, uh, just little advertisement to the very end. I'm, I'm looking for a postdoc in my group, postdoc in theoretical quantum computing and in these devices. Deadline like is in a month. So if you know somebody or if you want to join my group, please do.
uh, write me an email. And thanks for your time. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot for, for this inspiring talk. So uh, do we have any questions to Michal? I just maybe have a short question. So do you know any experimental group who is planning to do fermion sampling? <laughs> uh, not, uh, not, uh, not yet. I mean, some people actually were interested. Uh, some people were interested. But the, the bottom line actually seems to be the uh, uh, seems to be the and this is some work probably for the future uh, to you know to realize this fermionic interferometers you need depth depth uh, depth d okay which is linear in the number of qubits and perhaps in the circuit uh, in the square architecture you can maybe reduce this depth. Or maybe you can you, uh, have some other schemes when you will be doing random, from the, not uh, some other gates that would be fermionic uh, with shallow circuits. So this is uh, the, uh, this is the, let's say the the bottleneck. It's, uh, I mean, it would be nice to improve it. Okay, and some analogous work was done for random quantum circuits. So I, I should say that random quantum circuit modeling the. Uh, the depth is like uh, which is needed or that people do is square root of uh, the number of qubits. Okay, so we have linear in the number of qubits, uh, and yeah. but we use one D architecture, not two D. Okay, um, so I have a question that's very technical, so I'll wait. I mean, not very, but technical. To understand Any something. not technical question. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. Um, yes. Uh, just I, I wanted to know if I have the right intuition because you mentioned that if you don't have a magic state at the beginning, but you have a Gaussian state, uh, then it's 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 easy to um, the, the sampling is easy. And yep. is this the the same uh, as in if you have Gaussian boson sampling and you don't have photon counting at the end, but you have Gaussian measurement, that's also easy because everything Gaussian. So. I was wondering, does it make sense to envision something similar with fermions where you you have Gaussian state at the beginnings, but you change the measurement somehow at the end? Uh, is what is that the position is... of the resource? Right. Oh, that's a that's a fair question. Uh, uh, there are actually uh, I would that's a good question. I would imagine that it might be possible because there are. Uh, the, the point is in this work by Bravi that I cited, you have actually like a, it's like a trading of resources. So you can either have this magic state, okay? Or uh, you can have uh, basically measurement understood as instrument of the quartic Majorana uh, operator as instrument uh, or uh, implementation of some quartic gate. Right, so so that gives me hope that perhaps uh, something along those lines uh, um, can uh, uh, can happen. However, I would right uh, quartic quartic. I mean, like something like that. Uh, however, you know, like when you met, that's that's an interesting question. It's uh, I don't have a definite answer, but it, maybe it's worth exploring. Yes. Sorry, like uh, it's not obvious that it would work because somehow measurements, well, once you perform them, even though in this scheme that I was talking about, they uh, they uh, uh, they are a resource, but those those measurements are, in, are understood as instruments. So you care what happens to the state afterwards. Whereas in this scheme, after you measure, you don't do anything to your uh, like the uh, the quantumness is lost after you measure. Right. So uh, while here the state somehow enters the. Okay. It's just an okay. I think Mel Michal, you you have answered. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No, it's it's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You have answered. Yeah, I got. I got. No. I got fooled by the question. 
And so, yeah, like, okay, maybe. Well, I, I had, I didn't understand one concept. So you, I have this fermionic linear operations and then yeah. they form a class. And then somehow you show us how you map it onto qubits, no, by Jordan Wigner. Yeah. In the proof, okay, you went very quickly. You did some hard averaging, no? So that like, is correct, yes. Like here, for example. Example, right? yes. And this averaging you do on this qubit space, or so my question is: this sure. higher average yeah. is done in which space? Yes. So, and... so it's like a uh, good question. So let's say you have this U D, which is mapped to some. Uh, sorry, not uh, okay. I I cannot erase. Sorry, I don't know. How, uh, so you have U, which is mapped to this to this circuit that depends on U, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you basically have, uh, you have the, uh, so this is like in UD, and you have higher measure here. Okay, so, in the, the, so okay. this is parameters so you, parameterizing the yes, fermionic yes. operation. Okay. Yes, so that would correspond, and people did some work like, uh, like that for uh, optics. You know, what is the distribution on those uh, two mode beam splitters that you have in the REC architecture? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to have high random unitary or representation of high random unitary in the bosonic case, what would be the distribution on the individual element? So it would like it would get transformed a bit. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I think we need we need to stop now. Maybe we can leave Zoom running for a few minutes later on. But now let's thank Michal for the talk and Thanks. stop the recording.